What's up, everybody? Good morning, Mountain Movers. Good morning to those of you in the house, and good morning to those of you that are joining us online. So guess what? Today, Misty and I celebrate 23 years of unimaginable marriage. August 11th, boom. And she's still head over heels, madly in love with me. <laughs> Happy anniversary, babe. I love you. That's my best friend. Married my best friend. You should do that. You should do that. Today, we are going to jump right into part one of a new series that we are calling Hearing the Voice of God. How many of you guys, just by a show of hands, want to hear God speak to you in your life? Will you raise your hand? Amen. Me too. I get it from the outside looking in. Our friends and family that don't know the Lord think we're crazy because we serve a God that we cannot see with our human eyes. He doesn't come to us every day in a form. He doesn't have shape. He doesn't, you know, he does, but he doesn't come to us that way. So we have this relationship with an invisible God, if you will. If you're a believer sealed in Christ, you and I both know that the evidence of his existence is all around us. Creation is screaming out, there's a God, a creative, intelligent amazing God who created all of this. The, the book has an author. The book has an author. Um, the word of God has stood the test of time and has yet to be disproved. It's generation after generation after generation after generation. And it's still the number one best-selling book in all of human history. And it cannot be disproved. Prophetically, archaeologically, historically, this book is power. This book shows us over and over and over that there is a living and real God and it's seen in his word. But you know what impresses me the most is when we see the evidence of his existence alive and well in the lives of those who call him Lord. When you think about what that person used to be, who they used to be, how they used to think, how they used to talk, how they used to act, but then there was God. Then there was Jesus. And then something shifted, something changed. There was a real, genuine, spiritual transformation that took place in the life of that person. There is a God. I know it because I see it. The resurrection power has come to life in the life of this person. It's in me. It's in you. It can be seen. He's real. So the reality of who God is... That's not really the question for most people. Most people, whether they want to admit it or not, they know deep down there is a God. Yeah. The question that I think we should begin to ask ourselves for those of us who recognize his reality is does this big God who created all the universe and spoke existence into existence, does this God want to have relationship with me? Does this God want to talk to me? If so, does he only want to talk to some people and not others? Does he only talk to pastors or people who call themselves prophets? And by the way, if they have a business card that says they're a prophet, stay away. Yeah. Good advice. If somebody's <laughs> claiming they're a prophet, they're probably not. Don't. Just be very leery. Most prophets won't tell you they're a prophet. Does he only speak to apostle, apostles, church planters, and, and, and church leaders? And, and does he only speak to people who have this huge calling chasing them down? No. You know that. If you are sealed in Christ, you are a son or a daughter of God, and he loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. So now we have to dig a little bit deeper, okay? He wants to talk to all, to all of us, but yeah. we've been in ministry for over 20 years together, and one of the most common things we hear is, how am I supposed to hear God speak? How do I know it's him? How do I know he's talking to me? How do I know it's, it's not my imagination? How do I know it's not the devil? 
right? We hear it all the time. So in this series, we're going to get into those questions and we're going to teach you through God's word what God's word has to say about us, his people, hearing from him. I want to I'll tell you a story. It goes back to um, my boys uh, were, AJ was 12, Ty was 11. We were deer hunting and we were in this tower and surrounded just by tons of beautiful acreage. It was an evening rifle hunt. And just before the end of shooting light, and we hadn't seen anything, hadn't heard anything. And as you can imagine, 11, 12 year old boys, they're getting a little fidgety. They're getting a little impatient and I'm getting a little fidgety, a little impatient. And I stand up and we begin to gather our things and I hear something. And I sat back down and I said, boys, did you hear that? And they're like, no. And I said, okay, don't move an inch and stop breathing. (laughs) How many parents can relate? You've taken your kids hunting before. This is the talk. Stop moving. Stop breathing. Be still. Be quiet. And listen. And as they did, we all heard something. Now, we didn't know what that something was, but we heard something. And so we sat there, our ears just became attuned to this sound. We just sat there and we just pushed everything else out and we just intently focused and we listened and it was getting louder and it was getting closer and it was getting darker all at the same time. And we heard it coming from the West and we're looking intently and and before you know it, we saw an image coming towards us. But we didn't know what it was. Was it a mountain lion? Was it a a, a coyote? Was it a bobcat? What was it? About 100 yards from the stand, it became very clear. It was a buck. And it was a really nice buck. And we sat there until it came to us a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And that night, AJ harvested his first buck. Really nice deer. All because we learned to what? Listen. My boys learned something that night. You have to learn to listen for the right things. Once they were able to just quiet themselves, they heard the hoof prints, the steps coming through the leaves. They heard the sticks. They they heard something. You know, in our everyday lives, we are accustomed to the sounds of daily life, the ringing and the dinging of the cell phones and the email going off and the alarm waking us up. Or if you're like us with no margin in your life whatsoever, it's that light that and that ding that goes off on your dash that says your vehicle is on empty. There's sounds that we're accustomed to hearing in our everyday lives. And our relationship with God is like that. We we hear these sounds, we we know what those sounds are. But sometimes we we fail to listen for the sound of God's voice. And so today we want to talk about that. What does it mean to to, to really just settle in and to learn to listen and to begin to hear what God would have to say to us, his people? This morning we're going to take you to a passage in the Old Testament where God was teaching a young boy how to hear his voice for the very first time. Some of you might be familiar with this passage. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, but I kind of want to lay the groundwork for you of this story. So in this passage, we're talking about Eli the prophet. He's an old, old man. He's been a prophet now for many, many years for the children of Israel. And he now has this young boy by the name of Samuel. And Samuel has come to live at the temple, okay, at the tabernacle. He's basically Eli's assistant. He's learning the routines of the religion, if you will. He's learning all the right things to do, all right? And so Samuel has never heard God speak. He just knows all the rituals, all the things he's supposed to do at the right time. And so one night, Samuel is sleeping. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase this for you for a moment. But Samuel is sleeping and he's laying there in bed and all of a sudden he hears his name. 
Now, any of us know that if somebody calls your name and you're in a dead sleep, but you hear your name, you're probably going to wake up. Well, Samuel did. And Samuel jumped up when he heard his name, Samuel. And he got up. Well, the only person there was Eli. So he goes to Eli's room. He's like, yes, did you call me? And he's like, I can only imagine. It's the middle of the night. Did you ever go talk to your dad in the middle of the night? Now, maybe not mom, but dad. Like, Brad would be like, what? What? Eli is like, what? No, I didn't call you. Go back to, go back to bed. What happens again? Samuel goes and he lays down and he hears his name, Samuel. And he jumps up again and he runs back into Eli. Did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. Third time, Samuel hears his name, Samuel. He jumps up. He goes back into Eli and Eli says, I didn't call your name. But then he realized who was calling that boy's name. And he said, if you hear your name again, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, speak Lord, for your servant hears. Your servant is listening. Now listen. Samuel goes back and he lays down. And once again, what do you think he hears? He hears his name. He hears his name called out Samuel. And so what does he say? But speak, Lord, your servant is listening. You see, the fact is that night, God had a very important message he wanted to give to Samuel. He didn't care that the boy was only 12 years old. I want you to think about this, 12 years old old. God was talking to Samuel. Why? Well, one, God had a calling on that boy's life. Samuel was going to be the next prophet. A prophet was one that spoke for God. Okay. So like a pastor, but in that day, they didn't have the word of God. The prophet was the one that heard the message from God and delivered it to the people of God. It was a very important role. That was his purpose. And so that night, God gives him a really, really heavy message. And the message was basically this. Eli is in the wrong. Eli has been disobedient. Eli, the prophet you've been following, has not been disciplining his own sons. They've been living in sin. And because of it, I'm getting ready to come and bring judgment on his entire family. Now, I want you to think about this. He didn't come and just like say this, hey, just wanted to like, you know, point out who you're going to marry. You see that girl around the corner? She's been coming to the tabernacle, bringing her little offerings. Like, that's your wife. No, he didn't do that. He didn't just have a casual conversation. He trusted this 12-year-old boy with a really heavy message. Samuel had done something up to this point to prove to God that he could trust him. But what I want you to understand from this story is that the next day Eli comes in and Eli knew that God had probably spoken to Samuel. So he comes in and he's like, so did God speak to you? Yep. I think it's kind of, I play it out of my head, kind of like when your kids come home from school and they're in high school, you're like, how was your day? Good. Would you like to elaborate? Like anything you want to tell me? No, just good. Eli was like, tell me more. What did God say? Can you imagine being Samuel, having to tell Eli that God is about to bring judgment upon his life? But here's what's interesting. God trusted Samuel with a heavy message and Samuel had to follow through with obedience if he ever wanted to hear God speak to him. You see, the fact is so many times God is speaking and there's two things happening. Either one, we're not listening or we're not obeying. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. The fact is God is always speaking to his people. God wants to have relationship with his people. He's talking to his people through his word and through through circumstances, open and closed doors. We're going to be talking a lot about this in this series. But here's the question is, are you listening? Sometimes we're listening for a moment, but we don't like what God says. And because we don't like what God says, we don't follow through. And because we don't follow through with obedience, God doesn't keep speaking to us. 
Today, there's three things we want to show you in this passage. It's going to help you to hear from God. Because more than anything else as pastors, our heart cry is that you would understand that God wants to speak to you about your life. The first thing you need to understand is simply just that. God speaks to his people. He speaks to his people. The fact is, so many times we aren't expecting to hear from God. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. He was an old time preacher and he said this, those who do not believe God speaks specifically will simply ignore or explain away all the times when God communicates with them. However, those who spend each day in a profound awareness that God does speak are in a wonderful position to receive his word. You see, we have to expect God to speak. And you say, why why would God want to speak to me? Well, let me help you out. The Bible says in Psalms 139 that God formed you in your mother's womb. That God breathed life into you, that he has a purpose and he has a plan and he has a calling for your life just like he did Samuel's. And if God has a purpose and a plan for your life, don't you know that God wants to direct your every step? God formed you, he created you. He doesn't want you to just go off and do your own thing. But the only way we're going to understand what the plan is and what the purpose is that for which we were created is if we learn to hear the voice of God. You may not realize this. God cares about you. He really cares about every little detail of your life. Sometimes we think, no, he's so, God's, he's so busy. He doesn't have time. Okay, people. He is everywhere at once and all knowing and all powerful. He is never too busy. He has all the time in the world to step into your life. He knows, he knows every detail of your situation. Don't ever think that you're bothering him. Like you are his world. He loves you. He died for you. He rescued you because you were worth it. So when you realize that he cares for you and he wants to have relationship with you, know that he wants to speak to you. And we as his children should have, we should want to hear from God. We should have a desire in our hearts to want to hear what God would say to us. So I know this sounds really simple, but, but one of the first things that you need to do, if you want to hear from God in your life regarding any situation, I know this sounds simple, but you got to write this down and take this to heart and know that this is so, it's way more powerful than it sounds. But here it is. Ask him to speak. That's not meant to be sarcastic. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people in their prayer life don't simply ask God to speak. I can't tell you how many times in our prayer life, if you were just a fly on the wall in our prayer closets, you would hear us so often from day to day, just hear us just mumble this, this soft whisper, Lord, speak to me. Every day. We might be driving. We might be uh, literally in our Bible study. But we're just constantly saying, Lord, speak. God, speak to me. God, speak to me. There should be an anticipation in your heart and your spirit that God would speak to you. So ask him to speak. You hear Eli's instruction in this text to Samuel. What did, he, what, did, what did Eli tell Samuel to say to the Lord the next time the Lord spoke to him? But speak, Lord. Yeah. What? Your servant is listening. Yeah. So there's a lesson for us. We need to, to say to the Lord, speak. Yeah. And guess what? I'm going to listen. I'm going to open up my ears. I'm going to attune my ears to hear the voice of the Lord 
in my life. Oh, how that would change your prayer life. Think about this. How that would change your prayer life if you could change your prayer language from hear me, God, to here I am, God. There's a difference. And it's, 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 it's about, really, it's about perspective, right? It's about saying, it's not, it's not what I want from you, God, but it's what, it's what, what you want for me. And there's, there's a difference. Think about this. It's, it's, it's not about continually asking God for what you want. And it's easy to do that. It's easy to default into this mode of just constantly saying, God, do this. God, do that. God, would you do this? God, would you do that? But what kind of a relationship is that? There needs to be a, 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 you need to flip the switch with your mentality and the way you approach the throne room of God. And, think, and you have to think differently, not only about who he is and how we approach him, but who you are and how, how, how you specifically step into his throne room. It reminds me of what John F. Kennedy said. It's not, don't, don't be asking, you know, what, what can my country do for me? But what can I do for my country? It's a mentality of, of, of being a consumer versus being a contributor. It's the difference between being a, a, a beggar and a servant of the Most High God. Right. You think about it. The beggar asks, what can you do for me? And the servant says, what do you have for me to do? The beggar says, give me. And the servant says, I give you me. It's about learning to listen as a servant of God and saying, Lord, I'm yours. I belong to you. You died for me. You bought my life with a price, a mighty price, the blood of Jesus Christ. I belong to you. So here I am, Lord. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. I love how God approaches the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 33 and verse 3, and this was God's instruction to Jeremiah. He said, here's what I want you to do. Call to me. Say, call to me. He says, call to me. Guess what? And I will answer you. That is God's promise to those who call him. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. The Hebrew word for call here is kara, which means to cry out in order to get someone's attention. Guess what? God wants you to get his attention. He wants you to call out to him. He wants you to cry out to him. And then you notice this text, it's what's called a conditional clause. If you do this, God will do this. The text says, call out to me. And what's the result? What is the payout in this text? If we will step out and call out and say, God, I'm calling out to you. I'm trying to get your attention in my life because I'm expecting to hear from you. What is the payout? He says, I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. That Hebrew meaning for great and hidden things suggests things that are otherwise inaccessible that God has now made accessible. Think about that. The fact that there are currently in your life, inaccessible things that are hidden from you that you do not know about. God is willing and able to unveil those things to you and make those things accessible, but it's going to take something on your part. It's going to take effort in your relationship with God. It's one of the biggest mistakes we make as believers is we don't give enough effort in our relationship. We just came out of a marriage series. How much did you hear us talking about the effort that it takes in a relationship? Relationships take work. A marriage takes work. Your relationship with God takes work. It takes work. There has to be an effort to say, God, here I am. And man, I'm just crazy about hearing from you. I'm calling out to you. I'm crying out to you. God, I'm believing that you're going to speak to me and you're going to unveil and unpack those hidden things that otherwise have been inaccessible, but now you're making them accessible because I'm desperate for you and I'm hungry for you to hear a word from God for my life and my family and my career and my calling. God, I need you. When you call out to him desperately, God promises he will answer you. Amen. The third thing that we see from this passage that we have to do, and I think this is where most believers miss it, 
And it seems very simple, and yet it takes a little time, and that is we have to develop an ear to hear. Most of you in this room, even before this message, you would agree that God wants to speak to you. You would understand that I need to ask. But here's what we have missed so often in our lives is developing an ear to hear, learning how to recognize the voice of God. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 27, he said, my sheep, that's my people. They hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. If you read that entire chapter, it's a beautiful chapter in John chapter 10, all about Jesus being the good shepherd and we are the sheep who hear and who recognize his voice. It's kind of like a baby, you know, a baby that is being nurtured by parents. They learn to develop an ear for their mom or their dad's voice. And as they begin to get a little bit older, you can be in a room and you can call out your kid's name and they know when their mom or their dad is talking to them and they can spin around. Why? Because they have learned how to hear their name being called out. I remember as a kid, oftentimes we would be in a crowd of people and my mom could say my name. And when I heard my mom, I would stop and listen because if you didn't, there were consequences. <laughs> I grew up in that generation. It was like, no, 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 mom's talking. But the fact is you've got to learn how to recognize the voice of God. And it's not really that difficult, guys. It's just about this thing called time. You see, we live in a world where we schedule everything all day long. Like Brad says, there's so many noises going off, so many things fighting for our attention and for our schedule and for our calendar. But learning to hear the voice of God is about you taking time to be intentional to say, no, 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 no. I'm going to have a spot, a place where I'm going to get alone with God and I'm going to open the word of God, which throughout this series, we're going to teach you the different ways that God speaks to you. But the word of God is one of the first ways you need to understand when you open this book, it is God speaking to you. It is God speaking directly to you. And so making time to say, man, I'm going to open the word of God. And I'm going to quiet my spirit. And I'm not just going to read it because I got to check it off of you version. Or somebody told me that I had to do it. Samuel had been in the routine of doing all the religious things. But it wasn't until he stopped and listened. Did he hear the voice of God? I want to challenge you this week to do something that maybe you aren't accustomed to doing. Brad talked about how our boys, when they learned how to hunt, had to learn to be quiet. And it's funny how the tables have turned. Those boys are now big and you go hunting with them. They're telling me to be quiet. I'm like, don't tell me me to be quiet. Like I told you to be quiet. Like, but it's funny how they learned that you gotta, you gotta be quiet. You gotta listen. If you want to harvest the big buck, but if you want to hear the voice of God, you've got to quiet your spirit. See, there's a story in the Old Testament in 1 Kings where Elijah the prophet had gone head to head with 800 of the prophets of Baal. And he had had this huge, massive victory. God had rained down fire from heaven. He had wiped out all the prophets of Baal, the false God. Everybody knew that there was only one true God. But right after that, there was a threat put on the life of Elijah by Queen Jezebel. And Elijah found himself in hiding. He found himself in a very dark place and he needed to desperately hear from God. And I wonder how often do we get to the point where we desperately need to hear from God? That's where Elijah was. And when you read this passage, and I'm not gonna read it, I'm just gonna tell you about it. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, it says that God moved There was wind, there was a windstorm that came, there was an earthquake that came, there was fire that rained down, but God wasn't in any of that. But the very last thing this passage tells us is that there came a soft whisper and it was the voice of God. 
And here's what I want to challenge you with this week. I want to challenge you to find a quiet place where you can attune your ear to hear the quiet whisper of God in your life. You say, what, 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 what exactly, what does that look like? Well, here's what it looks like very clearly, okay? As we run out of time today, very clearly. Take 15 minutes out of a 24-hour day, 15 minutes. That doesn't seem like very much, does it? You waste more than that on social media, guaranteed. Take 15 minutes. Open your word and begin to, when you open your word, literally say, God, I'm gonna open your word. God, speak to me. Read for like five minutes. Then turn on a worship song and literally listen to the words and worship God. Don't let your mind go somewhere else. Don't get distracted. Worship God in that song, just like we do right here on a Sunday morning. And then rather than giving God your laundry list of things you want him to do for you, just simply say, God, I want to hear your voice, turn off the worship and sit in silence for five minutes. Now, those of you who are willing to try this, you're going to find that in about the first 30 seconds of silence, it's going to be hard. And your, your brain, you're going to have to reel your brain in because it's going to try to start the task list for the day. And it's going to try to think about all these other things. But I am telling you, if you will start disciplining yourself to quiet everything else in your life and say, God, speak, I'm listening. Stop talking and literally listen. This is when God speaks. I could tell you a million stories over the course of my life when God has spoken and God will speak in a lot of ways. And we're gonna talk about this. God will speak, he will confirm things. He'll speak in visions and dreams and all kinds of ways. But we wanna teach you how to quiet your spirit and hear the voice of God. But here's what it's gonna be. You're gonna be like, is it an audible voice? Like you're talking to me? Very rarely, very rarely. Although that does happen. More than likely, it is gonna be that soft whisper. You're gonna hear it in your heart and you're gonna just sense the power of the Holy Spirit in, your, in that place. And that is why even in these moments in the altars a few moments ago, when we want God to speak, when people are pressing into God's presence, that's the moment God wants to show up. He wants to speak. And some of you, you haven't moved out and done that. But these people that were down here, we're like, we're gonna hold time for a moment because God wants to speak to some people who are pressing in to his presence. Somebody's about to get a revelation. Somebody's about to hear from God. We're gonna sit in the silence for just a moment. We're gonna let God speak to them. Some of you have desperately been asking God for a word and that's when he gives it. When you are willing to press in and then sit and soak in the silence, God will begin to speak. This morning, we want to pray over you if you'll bow your heads. Man, God, I just know, Lord, that you have, you have a word for your people, God. You are a relational God. You want to speak to us. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would begin to stir the hearts of your people. God, to begin to realize those that have never heard your voice, that they would begin to be stirred to realize God loves you. He cares for you. He wants to talk to you. God, I pray today, Father, that they would do the work of developing their ear. God, I pray those that take the challenge, God, Lord, to get into your presence and to just ask to hear your voice. God, I pray that you would speak. Lord, I pray that you would speak so very clearly to their hearts, God. Those that have been asking for direction, God, speak. Those that have been asking for a word, God, bring it. Father, I just pray right now, Jesus. God, that we would learn how to step into that realm and hear your voice, Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, maybe you don't know the Lord.
you've never heard his voice because you don't have a relationship with him because you've been living outside of the fold. He is the good shepherd and he loves you and he is inviting you in to be his. The reality is sin separates us from him. He's pure and holy and perfect and our sin separates. It creates this chasm, this void between us and God. But Jesus became the bridge when he laid down his life on the cross. Through the power of his resurrection, he gives new life to those who are sealed in him, who have acknowledged their sin before him and believe him to be the son of God who takes away the sins of the world. He responds to those who confess him as Lord. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed today, you have the opportunity before you right now. The King of Kings, Jesus, is knocking on your heart's door. And he's saying, if you'll only open the door and let me in, I will come and be with you forever. Will you do that today? We're going to pray a prayer very similar to what I just explained We're going to pray this as a church family, and I would encourage you to pray this prayer with us. If you're asking God to save you and change you and give you a future in heaven, pray this prayer with us. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ is Lord. Help me, God, to begin hearing from you. Even today, speak to me, Lord. Your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen, amen, amen. 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 Well, if you are one who just prayed that prayer, that is by far the very best decision you will ever make in your life. I want to challenge you to do one more thing, and that is to text the words life change. Text life change to 844 MMC next. If you will text that number, you will get a message from Brad and I on what your next step is after praying a prayer of salvation and inviting Jesus into your heart. Also, if you're on campus today, as you exit those double doors, we have a gift for you called a next step kit. That's got a brand new Bible that you can understand so you can begin to hear the voice of God in writing this week. And if you're online today, we've got that for you. We will mail it to you. If you will just direct messages, your address, we'll mail it in the morning. Well, one last thing I want to just lay out for you before we head out today, and that is we've got one more week off this summer from midweeks, and then we go back on the 20th and the 21st. So this week, get your kiddos all back in school, get back in those routines, get your alarm set early, and then we will be back here on Sunday morning. And when we come back, we want to challenge you with an invite challenge this week. As you exit the double doors today, the worship hosts have packs of 10 invites just like this. These are the new invites. And they simply say this, you've tried everything else. It's time to try Jesus. This matches our billboard in town. And we want to challenge you when you go out to dinner this week or you go out to lunch, take an invite, put it on the table with a big fat tip. Do not be chintzy and leave an invite. You got it? Do not be chintzy and leave a church invite. But if you leave a good tip, leave an invite. It's an easy way to spread the hope of Jesus. Maybe you go to the gas pump, put one there. Maybe you want to just put one in the hand of someone you've been wanting to come to church. But we challenge you this week, take 10. All right, that means about 6,000 invites will hit the community this week if every single one of us will take them out as we go. 10's not very many. Can you do that today? Amen. All right, I'm gonna pray. Father God, we ask right now as we take these invites, God, and we go out into the streets, God, to our friends, to our, God, our neighbors, God, we pray, Father God, that you would put them in the hands of the people you want them to have them. God, we wanna be light in a dark community, Jesus. We wanna bring hope. God, I pray that we would live to make you famous. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.